Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. The professor entered the classroom of Bible students and said, we're in the business of reparenting people. When I first heard that statement, I didn't quite understand what he meant. Upon further reflection, and especially on this passage that we're going to be reading in just a moment, I realized that what he said was the absolute truth. Open your Bible with me to John chapter 8 and read with me beginning in verse 38. Jesus is in conversation with some of the Jews. This is what he said to them in light of the fact that they did not appreciate nor accept him. He said, I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. It's obvious in that text that he's identifying two distinct fathers. His father and their father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. Well, who is their father? I'd like to suggest to you on the basis of what he says is that the devil is their father. And he has, as his father, the father of heaven. Now, here's what the devil does. He's in the business of destroying. He lies. He takes advantage. And he destroys over the long term and the short term in any other way that he possibly can. He will destroy an individual through physical abuse. He will destroy an individual through sexual abuse. He will destroy an individual through emotional abuse. And we could go on and on at all the different mechanisms and schemes that he uses in effect to destroy people. However, the Heavenly Father is in the business of giving life and giving it to us abundantly. And there's a great deal of distinction in that, and it's reflected in our behaviors as it's reflected in the behaviors of these individuals. Uh, the behavior of Jesus is quite different than these Jews. Uh, they are rejecting him. They will ultimately crucify him. See the death involved in that? And yet he's in the business of giving life to folks. And so he indicates that they are doing the deeds of their father. Well, all of us, in one way or another, are marred by the devil in his work. We have been raised in families that some are uh, heavily influenced by the devil. Some are, I would say, more lightly influenced by the devil, but influenced by the devil nevertheless. And so we come to Christianity, we come to the Bible, marred by the effect that Satan has had upon us, and that causes us serious problems in a variety of different ways. And what I want to try to do in this series of lessons is talk with you about the family of God. I recognize that you are the family of God, and I want to talk with you about the responsibility that we have of perpetuating our family heritage. Not the heritage of the devil, but the heritage of our heavenly father. And the place to begin is with him. When we think about the family relationship and you look into the text of scripture, it becomes pretty obvious that uh, God presents himself in two roles that both involve family relationships. He presents himself as a husband to the nation of Israel and to the church, and he presents himself to the nation of Israel and to the church 
as a father. So I want to focus attention on these two elements in this class period and kind of introduce the fact that we are marred by the devil and that we are then in the process of being reparented uh, and transformed so that we can understand about God as a father and so that we can communicate him intergenerationally from not only our, to our children, but to our grandchildren and, and further on, and to those that uh, we might come into contact with uh, in the world. And so we're going to be looking in this series of lessons about this concept of God being both our husband and our father and being the model then that we are to pattern ourselves after and then extend that into the family that we're a part of, the church that we're a part of, the community, the world that we're a part of, so that we're in the business of uh, reparenting uh, people. And so what we're going to be doing this week is in this first lesson, we're going to talk about this familial relationship that God has with us. And in the second lesson, there's going to be a two-parter where we will give consideration to how God establishes and maintains his relationship with us considering four key concepts and their interrelationship with each other. And then lessons, um, lesson three, which will also be a two-part lesson, um, and then lesson three through five, we'll address how we execute God's family model in marriage and parenting, then in the church and in our relationships with the people of the world. Now, having said that, I want you to open your Bible with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verses 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. I want you to recognize that our familial relationship with God is founded upon his covenant with us. Now, I realized that uh, Mike Wilson was here back in thinking with 2016 or something like that. And, uh, he talked with you about this concept of covenant. Well, we're going to kind of enlarge on that a little bit as it relates to marriage and family relationships. This text in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 and following says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what Harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Now listen to this one in verse 18. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I'd like to suggest to you that there are two familial relationships suggested in this text. First of all, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. When you come across that phrase, I will be their God, and they shall be my people, you need to understand that this is covenantal language throughout the text of Scripture. I will be their God. They will be my people is uh, something that is repeated over and over again. It's covenantal language. You might even see in it language that is similar to a marriage um, kind of language. Because when we get married, really, that's what we're saying, isn't it? I'm going to be yours and you're going to be mine. And what God is saying to his people is, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people. And so this idea of being a husband is inherent in this, and the idea of being a father is also inherent in this uh, particular text. But a lot of people come to this text and they say, well, is this talking about marriage? Uh, can, can a Christian marry somebody that's uh, uh, not a believer? Well, really, that's really not the point in this text. It's way broader than that way bigger than that. This is talking about our relationship with God, and it's talking about the exclusive nature of that relationship. And when you read there in the verse, uh, verse 16, there is a quotation 
out of the Old Testament, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is from Exodus chapter 29 and verse 45. You remember what the book of Exodus is about. It's about the nation of Israel coming out and being separate from the Egyptians. So God is calling his people out to be separate from the Egyptians and to be exclusively joined together with him. Notice again in verse 17, therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. A quotation from Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 11, when the nation of Israel in, is in Babylonian exile and God is calling them away from Babylon. Come out and be separate. Come out and be joined together with me exclusively. So what we're looking at here is this kind of marital idea of separating from all others and being joined together with God in this special relationship, familial relationship. So what we're looking at here is God's call to his people to be different because of their relationship with him. And so what that means is, is that we become a unique people called out of the world and joined together with God. We could use this language as one flesh with him, or we become one body with him, or we could say we become one family with him. And this is language that is familiar to all of us, I'm sure. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 beginning. Peter says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, now, just notice the language here for a moment. A chosen race it means that you are the ones that have been selected, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A lot of times when we think of holiness, we think of ethical purity and that sort of thing. This idea here is that they are different. They are selected apart. They're separated apart to God. A people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So, like 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is suggesting, we are called out of Egypt. In that language, Egypt represents the world. We are called out of Babylon. In that language, Babylon represents the world. So the people of God are called to be separate in an exclusive relationship with him in this covenant that he has made with us. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15 and follow. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. Now, a lot of times we come across this phrase, the two becoming one flesh. We think in terms of sexual kinds of things. I'd like to suggest to you that in the ancient world, the emphasis was not so much on um, sexual intimacy as it was the building of relationships and families. They became one family. They became one group. They became descendants of each other. And as you read through the patriarchal period and the significance of having children and all that kind of thing, you kind of get a flavor for that. So it's less about sex and more about the building of this heritage, okay? So you need to think about it that way. This one body, this one fleshness that we're, we're building something here. We're building a, a lineage. We're building a household. We're building a family. Um, and so the patriarchs tended to think that way. And I think that at least I see evidence in 
in the Old Testament especially of that kind of language. But here in this text, the two shall become one flesh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So when we join ourselves with the Lord, we're building this lineage, this heritage, this family. We're perpetuating our father's family. Flee immorality, every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Does it have implications relative to sexuality? Well, sure it does, just like marriage has implications for sexuality. But the bigger picture is devotion to God. Exclusive devotion to God, being one flesh, one body, one family. So the primary relationship, uh, as far as the family is concerned, is the husband-wife relationship. In the Old Testament, of course, God is the husband, and Israel is this chosen wife. Uh, you might remember when um, God commissioned Moses to go down to the land of Egypt. What was Moses' message to Pharaoh? Or shall we say God's message through Moses to Pharaoh? Let my people go. Did you hear it? Let my, these are my people. I will be their God. They will be my people. See the identification here? Let my people go. I'm suggesting to you that this is the kind of language that is used in a husband-wife kind of commitment or covenant. And this is the language that uh, is used in, is in the book of Ezekiel and a variety of other uh, texts in the Old Testament. Open your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 16 with me. Ezekiel chapter 16 is a very graphic text and a very powerful text to kind of give us a flavor for this overall view of what we're talking about in connection with our marital relationship with God. Chapter 16 opens with God describing the nation of Israel as of their father, the devil. He uses this language. Your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Now, who are these people? These are all idolaters. You're, you came right out of the world. And what happened was, is these worldly people that gave birth to you abandoned you. He says, no eye look with pity on you to do any of the good things that one would normally do for a child to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. All right, so here, here's this people that are born to the world and they're thrown out in the field, just abandoned. And what happens is, that God says in verse 8 that he passed by and saw you, and behold, you were all at that, well, actually in verse 6, when I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I saw, said to you while you were in your blood, live. So they're about to die. They're there lying in the field, squirming in their blood, and God comes along and says, live. I notice the distinction between death and life here. God's in the business of bringing life and the devil is in the business of bringing what? Death and destruction. So they are of their father. Yes, it's represented with the Hittites and, uh, and the others, the Amorites and the Canaanites. But all of these have as their father the devil. And this is the consequence. And so they're thrown out into the field. And God comes by and says, live. And God brings them life. So in verse 8, in addition to bringing them life, he helps them to thrive and they begin to grow and, and good things happen. But I passed by you and saw, and behold, you were at that time for love. In other words, they have 
reached the, the, the time that they could be married. And so he spread his skirt over them and covered their nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine. See the language? I entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine. And I bathed you and I took care of you and I clothed you and I adorned you with wonderful things and I fed you with magnificent foods and I caused you to thrive and you were beautiful to me. And we had a beautiful relationship. But then he says, well, you know, if um, you were found in that kind of condition and somebody came by and took care of you and provided you with life, and clothed you, and compassionate towards you, and loved you, and gave you all the good things, what would your natural response be? Pardon? To love them back. Exactly. To love them back, to, to be thankful, to be appreciative of what this person has done for you in bringing you this life. But now that's not what the nation of Israel did. What did she do instead? Well, the text says she trusted in her beauty. Now, I want you to recognize that the husband's responsibility is to help the wife to be beautiful. And that's what he's done for the nation of Israel. And so she trusts now in her beauty. And what she does is she becomes a harlot. But not just any harlot. In verse 23 and follow. It came about after all your wickedness. Woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God, that you built yourself a shrine and made yourself a high place in every square. And you built yourself a high place at the top of every street and made your beauty abominable. And you spread your legs to every passerby to multiply your harlotry. Did you hear it? Talk about a harlot. She's a harlot of the worst variety. And as the text continues, it continues to describe her. He says in verse 32, you adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband, men give gifts to harlots, but you give your gifts to your lovers to bribe them to come to you from every direction for your harlotries. In other words, he's saying, that generally harlots receive pay. And what you're doing is you're paying your lovers. Well, now where's God in all this? Where's their husband in all this? Well, what he does is he gives them up to their harlotries. And the text indicates in verse 43 that he is enraged by her conduct. Well, that would be normal, wouldn't it? We could expect that to happen. And so he allows them to experience the consequences of their actions. But that's not the end of the story. In verse 59, he says, I will also do with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath by breaking the covenant. Verse 60. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Wait a minute. I thought that they were the worst kind of harlot that there could be. And that he is enraged with them, and he's allowing them to experience the consequences of their actions in association with the 
destruction of Jerusalem and uh, being taken captive by the Babylonians and that kind of thing. And yet this text is saying that he remembers his covenant with them. And that what he's going to do is he's going to extend his kindness yet to these people. In verse 61, then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both your older and your younger, and will give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, and so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation. What's he saying? I'm going to be kind to you, even though you have been unkind and despicable in your actions. I'm going to remember my commitment to you. And I'm going to be loyal to my commitment to you, no matter what you've done. And by this commitment to you, I'm expecting your heart to be softened to the point that you're humiliated and that you repent of the behavior that is characteristic of you as you have practiced your harlotry. And so he wants them to come to a situation where they are ashamed and humiliated. He says, when I have forgiven you for all that you have done. Well, here's the model husband, isn't it? He's entered into a covenant with them. He's provided wonderful blessings for them. He's caused them to thrive and they have rejected it. And yet he is their husband who is committed to them, whose name is the Lord of hosts, who has called them out from the world. And his response is even though they have been unfaithful, that he remembers his covenant and he's going to extend forgiveness to those that are willing to receive it, changed in heart. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verses 31 and following, it refers to making a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with them when I brought them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. Now, when you come into the New Testament, it's the same kind of thing, isn't it? Christ is the husband and we are the bride. We can all quote Ephesians chapter 5, 21 and following. We recognize this. Christ is the husband and we are the bride. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2 talks about how that we are betrothed to Christ. And it's interesting to me as I read through the gospel accounts, the emphasis on these different um, passages that have wedding themes as the background. Uh, for example, look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus spoke to them in parables. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat and livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So here goes the invitation to this great wedding feast of God. Uh, you could say that the prophets communicated the invitation to the people of the nation of Israel, inviting them into this special wedding party. Verse 5, but they paid no attention. And went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. 
And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out in the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with wedding guests. So here we go. You could interpret that and say, okay, here are the prophets that are sent to the nation of Israel with this invitation to the wedding feast. And then when they rejected it, why the message went out to the Gentiles, it went to the world, and, and they were invited to the wedding feast. Many of them responded. You see. Well, this image of a wedding feast, let's think about this for a moment. This idea of a Jewish wedding and traditions associated with a Jewish wedding are in the background here as well as in the background later on here in the book of Matthew when you read about the this, this story of the parable of the, of the ten virgins over in chapter 25. You know, five of them are wise and are prepared because they have the oil for their lamps, extra oil as a matter of fact. They don't know when the bridegroom is going to return. Idea is, in association with Jewish today, wedding tradition, is the bridegroom comes and with the bride, they are betrothed to each other. They make promises. They make wedding promises to each other. They make an oath to each other. I'm yours and you're mine. Then the groom goes away and makes preparations in his father's household. And then what he does is he returns to take his bride to his father's household. Right? Typical wedding tradition, Jewish. That's what this is talking about here. The, the groom has gone away and he's going to return. And the wedding party doesn't know when he's going to return. But they need to be prepared. So the message is, we need to be prepared for the bridegroom's return. Five of them are, five of them are not. And the five that are, of course, go with the bridegroom to the celebration, shall we say, of the wedding feast. Now, those of you that are familiar with uh, Isaiah and Revelation and that kind of thing are already being reminded about wedding feasts and great feasts associated with the coming of the bridegroom. And in the Lord's Supper this morning, we will proclaim his death until he comes again. And so we're looking forward to the coming of the bridegroom to go to the wedding feast, right? Look with me in John chapter 14. Jesus is about to leave his disciples. He's going to be crucified. And in this passage, he's working to comfort them. This is what he says. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Get the idea? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That doesn't say a thing in the world about a wedding, does it? Doesn't mention Jewish wedding tradition. I'd like to suggest to you, however, that that's what's in the background. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away, I'm going to come back. Take you to be with me. Okay? So the ideas throughout the text of the New Testament involve... God's people as his wife and Christ as the husband. And Jesus, as he institutes the Lord's Supper, says this is the blood of the covenant. Blood of the covenant. Revelation chapter 21 verse 2 defines the new Jerusalem as the bride. Okay, you see that element. Well, let's uh, talk just briefly about this other element in the family. That is the secondary family relationship, God as father and his people as sons and daughters of his. God's message to Pharaoh, let my son go. Yes, 
let my son go, let, let my people go. This time, yes, both phrases are used of husband, let my people go, and of father, let my son go. Let my son go. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 6, God says, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And so he gives them his name. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 extends to the Corinthians the sonship characteristic of the nation of Israel. The Corinthians are extended this sonship. Christians are extended this sonship, the same as the nation of Israel. We are sons of God. Galatians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, we have received the adoptions, adoption as sons, so we cry, Abba, Father. The children of God are now to live and to love like their father who loves them. And so the father abides in us in this way. And we've been chosen to be adopted into this wonderful family or this household of God. Now, here's the deal. In Psalm 127, the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Here's my thinking. The Lord's been in the business of building a house for a long time. And he's modeled for us how to build a house. Oh, we're not talking about a physical structure with four walls. We're talking about a lineage. We're talking about a heritage. We're talking about a family. We're talking about a household. And God's in the business of building this. And if we could somehow or the other get insight into the way that he builds his house, That might give us a real leg up on knowing how to build ours. You think? You know what we do? Is we tend to take the model that we've seen in our own parents, whatever that model is. It's what we know. And then we tend to reproduce it in our own family with our own children, with our own spouse. Now, for those that had Christian parents, you say, well, my parents were, were fantastic, and I loved them, and, and they were the perfect models. And I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, they probably weren't perfect, but uh, what you're saying is that they were very helpful to you. I appreciate that. I want to tell you this. God's a better model. He's a better model of a husband. He's a better model of a father. Because your parents and my parents and you and me have all been marred. By the father of this world. And our father who's in heaven is in the business of transforming us. He's telling us to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why does my mind need to be renewed? Because the devil has had a powerful influence on my thinking. And what I need is I need to be reparented. And I need to see who my father is, the one in heaven, the one who is the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the one who is in the business of transforming me into being what I need to be, what I ought to be, not only in my relationship to my wife or my relationship to my children. 
he's in the business of transforming me to cause me to be able to influence the church and cause me to be able to influence the world. I'll tell you something. I need to be following his model. I won't do it perfectly, but I need to be following his model. Because unless he builds the house, I'm laboring in vain. Okay, thank you for your attention this morning. Um, in the next class period, we'll talk about how God establishes and maintains his relationship with us. We'll talk about that in the next hour and then in the hour uh, this evening at 5.30 as well. And we'll look at these concepts. We're going to go back to this concept of covenant. And we're going to begin a study that I hope will last a long time for you as you give consideration to this concept of covenant as it is used both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to go and look and see what the covenant entails as God made a covenant with Abraham and, 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 and what uh, traits this kind of covenant has and uh, see what God did with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and others as he formulated this covenant with his people and how he did it and how he maintained his relationship with them. All right, thank you for your attention. <clears throat>